dust off the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. Find chapter 17. Actually, back up into chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Find verse 29. Listen as, as I read. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, now circle that name because we're going to be watching that guy for several weeks. Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel. Circle that, because we're going to see her over and over again in our study of the life of Elijah. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. He built a temple for Baal in Samaria. That's the idea. Verse 33, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now move to chapter 17 and look at verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. We begin today a series of messages in the life of Elijah that I am calling simply, These Are the Days of Elijah. And I want his life to challenge you to be the man of God, the woman of God in a culture that has largely forgotten God, turned its back on God. These are indeed the days of Elijah. Let's pray. Would you pray for me right now and ask the Lord to speak through me his word today? And then would you pray for yourself and say, Lord, let me hear your word. Don't let me miss what you have to say to me today, Heavenly Father. So pray for me and pray for yourself. I'll do the same. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship today, to sing praises to you. You are indeed the champion of love, Father. You've loved us with an everlasting love, an unconditional love, sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, we want to be your men. We want to be your women. We want to be your people in this community. Challenge us today as we begin a study in the life of this prophet Elijah. Let us, let us understand and see the conditions in the culture in which he lived and how he responded to them and how he related to them. Let us be your people in our day just like Elijah was in his. So Father, open, open our spiritual ears and eyes to your truth. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the one thing, what is the one thing you could do that would make a difference in your home, spiritually speaking? What is the one thing you could do that would make a difference in your home? What is the one thing you could do that would make a difference where you work? What is the one thing you could do that would make a difference in this church? your community, Mount Vernon and Franklin County that we live in? Or what is the one thing you could do 
that would make a difference even in the life of our nation. There is nothing the church of today needs more than difference makers. Men and women of spiritual power whose presence creates and changes the atmosphere. It's easy to look at the circumstances in which you and I live. It's easy to look at the circumstances maybe in your home or where you work. It's easy to look at the circumstances in our community. And it's easy to look at the circumstances in the nation that you and I live in and cry out in despair, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God that works miracles? Where is the God that sends fire down from heaven? Where is that sends fire down from heaven God that Elijah saw? The answer to that question is he's right here and he's never left. The answer to that question is, is that same God that we are going to see in the life of Elijah working miracles and bringing fire from heaven, that same God is here and has always been here waiting to do for us as much, if not more, than he did for the saints of old. So the question is really not where is the God of Elijah. The question is where are the Elijahs? Where are the men who will stand firm and be bold in their faith? Where are believers, men and women, who will with no fear declare, this is what God says. The word of the Lord says this. Where are leaders who are uncompromisingly strong, yet self-controlled, disciplined, yet forgiving, audaciously courageous, yet kind. Where are the Elijahs? It's our duty. It's our task to stand before our God as Elijah stood before his. Then we will see the same God work that Elijah saw in his day. For indeed, these are the days of Elijah. Now let me give you the backstory. We've sort of jumped in right here in the middle of 1 Kings chapter 16 and 17. Let me put the verses that I read a moment ago in context. Let me give you a quick Old Testament history lesson. For well over 100 years, Israel as a nation had three kings. They lived, the nation did, under the leadership of three different kings. Saul, David, and finally Solomon. At the end of Solomon's life, a civil war broke out in the kingdom. And as strife grew in intensity, the nation of Israel became divided into a northern kingdom that the Bible refers to as Israel and a southern kingdom that the Bible refers to as Judah. And those kingdoms remained until both of them fell to foreign invaders. The northern kingdom in 722 B.C., the southern kingdom in 586 B.C., and in both cases, the Jews were led away to captivity. From the beginning king in Israel, the northern kingdom, Jeroboam was his name. And for a period of over 200 years, the northern kingdom had 19 monarchs. 19 kings, and all of them were wicked. Not one of them served God. Now, can you imagine that as a nation? 19 national leaders in succession. 19 kings back to back who did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as the Scripture says. And then came the Assyrians invaded and conquered in 722 B.C. As I said a moment ago, Jeroboam was the first king in the northern kingdom, and he got things started off in a very tragic way. 
by setting up idols and doing evil in God's sight. And then, as I said, 19 of his kings followed him, king after king, ruler after ruler, until we reach a guy named Omri. I didn't read about him a moment ago, but if you just back up into chapter 16 and verse 25, you read, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, more evil than all who were before him. It's almost as if every king did more evil than the one before him. And then Omri had a son named Ahab, who it says in verse 30, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And then Ahab did something that none of the other kings had done. He married a pagan woman named Jezebel. And if Omri was Jesse James, Ahab and Jezebel were Bonnie and Clyde. Because they did evil. Jezebel brought into the nation of Israel her religious heritage. She was a Baal worshiper. Baal was the god of rain and and fertility. And so all across the nation of Israel, temples to Baal were built. It was a land full of priests of Baal. God's prophets were persecuted, slain, and run out. Israel is now a land of idolatry, immorality, compromise. The people had turned their back on God's word and God's ways. Now, you might suppose that... That was going to be the end of it, that the nation would never be revived, that the worship of Jehovah would never return, that idolatry and immorality would forever be the norm. You might think that there will never be a revival in our nation. You might think there will never be a revival in this community, that immorality and idolatry will just continue to be the norm. You might think that this community will never change. You might think your family will never change or your workplace will never change. And if you think that, you have left something out. No, not something. You have left someone out. You have left out Jehovah God. When men have done their worst and evil is at its height, it is time for God to begin. Look at chapter 17, verse 1, the first word, now. You can almost hear the sigh in God's heart. Now. It's an ominous warning to the foes of God. It is a word of hope and promise to the friends of God. Now, there is a deep ache over the sins of the people in the heart of God. And if you miss that, you miss the impact of what happens next. God is never at a loss. The land may seem overrun with sin. The whole force of popular opinion may run counter to his truth. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. And without any introduction, without any warning, Elijah suddenly appears. Out of the blue. Just like that. He is simply called Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe. Scholars are not sure where that was. It's not even a dot on anybody's map. Elijah comes from heaven. He is God's heaven-sent man, and he makes a stunning proclamation to Ahab the king. This is the king who had done more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of the kings before him. Elijah stands up and steps out with an amazing word from God. I picture him standing there in front of Ahab with his finger pointed at at, at Ahab saying, there will not be any more rain, not a drop. There's not going to be any dew on the grass even until I command it so. I alone will determine when it rains next. Bold, yes. Courageous, yes. Uncompromising, absolutely. But it's exactly what the times called for. 
The days he was living in demanded such action. And that's where you and I, that's where your life and mine intersect with Elijah. These are the days of Elijah. We are living in them. And so we say this morning as we begin this message, this series of messages, these days demand different difference makers who stand up and step out. There's a situation in your home and it demands that someone stand up and step out. That's you. There's a situation in your work and someone needs to stand up and step out. That's you. There's a situation in your church. There's a situation in your community. There's a situation in our nation that demands that somebody stand up and step out. That's you. That's you. You and I live in days where people are bowing down to idols. You and I live in days where immorality is commonplace. You and I live in days where God's truth is compromised, where God's truth is ignored, where, where God's truth has been pushed out of the discussion in derision. And we could run away from our responsibility. We could make excuses for the conditions in our home, in our workplace, in our community. We, we could make excuses for the conditions in our nation. We could blame this and that and the other. Or we can stand up and step out. One of the places that we visited on vacation, my family and and I spent some time in Charleston, South Carolina, and then Deborah and I, just the two of us, spent some time in Savannah, Georgia. And we didn't want to stay. We didn't know where to stay in Savannah. We, we, we didn't want to stay in a chain motel. We could have stayed in the Western Inn. We could have stayed in the Holiday Inn Express. We could have stayed in the Hampton Inn. We could have stayed in the Embassy Suites. But Deborah did some research on the Internet and found a place called the Planter's Inn. We'd never heard of it. We'd never seen it. We just saw the pictures that were on the website. And so that's where we decided to stay. We decided to stay at the Planters Inn in Savannah, Georgia. We got there, and it was a, a little building, not, not very big at all. And it had been remodeled on the inside, and very nice. We got up to our room, and on the bed, there is a card on the pillow this kind of gives the history of the Planters Inn. And on that card explaining the history of the Planters Inn, it says this. The site that you are now standing, the building is no longer here, but on this site where you are standing, John Wesley's parsonage stood. The reformer who came to Savannah in 1733. On this site, John Wesley's house stood, and he, he slept here, and he led Bible studies out of his living room right here. I'm going, Lord, give me some of this. Give me some of this, Lord. I need, I need some of John. I, Brother John needs to come. I need, I need to see. I need his spirit in me. I was, I was reading John Wesley's journals. When he observed the conditions of the idolatry and evil around him, he wrote in his journal, Never in my life have I heard such language, such swearing, and have seen such wickedness. We are ripe for revival. Amen. Amen. Can you and I adopt Wesley's position? Never have we seen such immorality. Never have we seen a time when God's word was pushed out of the discussion. Never have we seen a time when so much idolatry was present in our nation. We are ripe for revival if people will stand up and step out. See, God's about to use you. God is about to use you to stand up and step out. 
You say, how, Brother Pepper? How do I do that? Well, let's spend just a few more minutes analyzing verse 1. And a simple analysis of just this one verse in chapter 17 will show us how to stand up and step out. So let me read it again. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1 says, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain in these years except by my word. How do you obtain a boldness to stand up and step out? How do you muster the courage to speak a word from God in your situation? It starts with a conviction. The conviction is this. My God is alive. Do you know what a conviction is? Do you know what the difference between a conviction and an opinion is? The difference between a conviction and an opinion is an opinion is something that you hold. Here's what I believe about that. Here's what I believe about that. Here's my opinion on that. An opinion is something that you hold. You know what a conviction is? Something that holds you. Something that holds you. That's a conviction. Something that you will not be moved off of no matter what happens. Something that you will not be moved away from no matter what the circumstances. A opinion is something that you hold. A conviction is something that holds you. And you must, in order to stand up and step out, you must have a simple conviction. Your God is alive. You see what it says there in verse 1? It says, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. To everyone around him, the Lord God must have seemed distant. To everyone around him, the Lord God must have seemed dead. But to Elijah, the Lord God was the supreme reality in his life. So right from the get-go, he's not afraid without a moment's hesitation, with no fear whatsoever, with not any kind of reluctance. Isaiah stands up, steps out before Ahab the king and tells him like it is, buddy, it's not going to rain until I say so. There's not even going to be dew on the ground until I give it the word. Why? Because Elijah has a word from God. He isn't necessarily trained. He isn't necessarily polished. He just knows my God is alive. And therein lies the boldness to shake his fist in the devil's face and say, no more. The Lord God of Israel lives. God's looking for men like that in Mount Vernon, Texas. God's looking for believers, for women like that in Mount Vernon, Texas. He is looking for men and women who will live with the conviction, my God is alive. My God still acts. My God still changes circumstances. My God still moves in the hearts of people. My God is alive and I will speak his truth to those around me. You see, our Lord is searching for men and women who who dare not be mediocre. Our Lord is searching for men and women who dare not blend into the background. Sometimes you have to look awfully close and talk awfully long before an individual will declare his or her allegiance to God. Don't be like that. Sometimes you have to look long and hard to find someone with the boldness and the courage to stand alone for God. Be that person. Have a conviction that holds you. Your God is alive. Second thing. How do you be a stand-up, step-out, make-a-difference Christian? You cultivate a lifestyle lived in God's presence. Look at that interesting expression in verse 1. Before whom I stand. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I I thought Elijah was standing in the presence of Ahab. (laughs) No, he was conscious of a far greater presence in his life. 
he was standing in the presence of his God. And Elijah lived with that constant awareness that he was in the presence of his God. And therefore, his sole allegiance was to his God. He served the God of Israel. He did what God said do. He went where God said go. He said what God said say. And where you work, and where you live, needs more people just like that. God's looking for people. In these difficult days, God is looking for special people who will live their days in a constant awareness of God's presence in their lives. On Friday, after, after you've been gone on vacation for 10 10 days, you got some cleaning to do when you get home, particularly outside. And so there was some weeds that needed pulled and there were some things that needed cleaned and there were some things that needed swept. And so I was, I was working in my backyard. I was out there on the back patio and, and I have some weights on the back patio. I have barbells on the back patio where, where I work out. And I, I know you knew that because you can you can tell by this physique that I work out with barbells. But do you know what I found? I found cobwebs on my barbells. <laughs> cobwebs on my barbells. Now, now, you think I might have been neglecting my workout just a little bit if I got cobwebs on my barbells? Let me ask you something. Are there cobwebs on your walk with the Lord? Are there cobwebs? Have you been neglecting His presence in your daily life? Have you been living with no awareness of His nearness? God looks for people who will take him into the schools, who will take him into the classroom, who will take him into the shop, who will take him into the office. We need young men of God. We need young women of God. We need teachers and, and athletes and coaches and painters and plumbers and doctors and lawyers and homemakers and homeowners and public figures and private citizens. We need people of God who will stand tall, stand firm, stand strong simply because they cultivate a lifestyle every day where they are living in God's presence. There is an awareness in their lives that they stand before God at all times. That's you. That's you. It must be you because these are the days of Elijah and they demand it from us. And then thirdly, there's another step. Another step to living bold and courageous. Another step to standing up and and stepping out. We must confess, my God is Jehovah. And he is my strength. Just look at verse 1 at the word, the name Elijah. The Hebrew word for God is Elohim. And when it's abbreviated, it is E-L-L. Jah is the... Hebrew word for Jehovah. Thus, in Elijah's name, we find the word for God and the word for Jehovah. Then right there in the middle is the letter I. And in the Hebrew language, that's a personal pronoun that means my or mine. And when you put them all together, Elijah's name means my God is Jehovah. And contained in those words, Elohim and Jehovah is the idea of the strong one. And so some translations believe that Elijah's name means the Lord is my strength. The Lord is 
My God, my God is Jehovah. He is my strength. You see, you're thinking right now, Pastor, there's somebody better qualified than I to step up. There's somebody better qualified than, than me to speak a word for God where I work, in my home, in this community, among my friends, in my neighbors. There's somebody, there's somebody, Pastor, better qualified than me to stand up and, and step out. No. No. It's time you stood up and stepped out. It's time for you to confess, my God is Jehovah. He is my strength, and with him and in his strength, I will do it. I will stand up and step out. When I was on the board of trustees at Howard Payne University, one of the speakers that came to us one morning during our board meeting was the president emeritus of Howard Payne at that time, a man named Don Newberry. Don Newberry had been president of Howard Payne, but he was no longer the president. He had the title of president emeritus, and he came to speak to us one day as the trustees of the university, and he told us this story. He said, men and women, I want you to know that I went to a Texas Ranger baseball game recently. And during the national anthem, as we were standing, I noticed that there was a young man about three rows in front of me who didn't take his cap off during the national anthem. He uh, talked to the person next to him during the whole time. He paid no attention. He wasn't standing still. Everybody else is showing respect for the flag, but not this one young man. He is, he is not paying attention nor respect at all. And during the national anthem, one of those attendants from the Texas Rangers that work the aisles, that come down between the innings and turn around and make sure everything's okay, one of those attendants from the Texas Rangers came down during the national anthem and put his arm around the young man and took off his hat and made him stand there at attention without his hat while the national anthem was being played. And when the national anthem was over with, he turned to the young man and he said, young man, you need to talk to somebody about what that flag means. You need to talk to your parents. You need to talk to a coach. You need to talk to, to, to a school teacher. You need to talk to somebody. And you need to learn what it means to show respect during the national anthem. And then the attendant took out his wallet and handed him a $10 bill and said, here, get you a hot dog and a drink and enjoy the rest of the game. And the attendant left. About the fourth inning, when that attendant's been going back and forth, Dr. Newberry stopped him and said, Sir, I, I saw what you did during the national anthem, and I just want you to think, I, I just want to thank you. I saw what you did about putting your arm around the young man. I heard what you said to him about learning respect for the flag, and I just, again, I just want to thank you for what you did for that young man. And here's what the attendant said to Dr. Newberry. He said, Sir, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. But it's not going to do it in my section. <laughs> You've got a section. You've got a section. We all have a section. The world's going to hell in the handbasket. But it's not going to happen in my section. Not going to happen in this town. Not going to happen in this community. Not going to happen where you work. Not going to happen in your home. Not going to happen. Because we're going to be believers who... Stand up and step out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,
we look around our lives today, the community, and particularly our nation, and we see that the need is great. Now more than ever, we, we, we need men and women like Elijah. Men and women who are not afraid. Men and women who are not afraid to make a difference, to stand up and step out. And so, Father, I pray we will. I pray we will be like Elijah. And I pray, Father, that... Uh, that we will see you work as in the days of Elijah. We'll see you work in our day because we are willing to be to you what Elijah was to you. A man who lives with the conviction that you are alive. And the presence of you in his life every day. Confessing, my God is Jehovah. And in his strength I will do what he's called me to do. So Father, we take up the challenge today of this prophet's life. And in the weeks ahead, let us grow in our knowledge of you grow in our boldness and our courage as we look at his life thank you today Father thank you for your word it's in Jesus name mighty name I pray amen we're going to sing a song of commitment as we as we come to this time in the service wherever he leads I'll go how appropriate could that be you sing it as a testimony to the Lord today you sing it as your heart would say those words and mean them wherever he leads wherever you lead me Lord I'll go I'll go the office, the shop, the workplace, the school, the classroom, the community. I'll go. I'll take up my cross and I'll follow you. If you're here today, friend, sir, ma'am, teenager, if you're here today and you've never come to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if you've never confessed Him as your Lord and Savior, if you've never been saved, today's the day you can do that. In a moment when we stand and sing, make your way out of the row. and You can either come here to the front to me or go to the back. We have people at the back as well to be able to help you understand what it means to be a believer and a Christ follower. Maybe that's where you are today. You're ready to become a Christ follower. If you'd like to unite and join our church today, this is one of the moments you can come and join our church. We'd gladly welcome you today. Let's stand. Let's stand. And let us lift our voices with, with, with these words that are our testimony as we leave today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Let's sing, friends.